Well, thank you all so much for coming. We're excited to be putting this on. And like Jonathan mentioned at the end, uh, we, d we do want some feedback. So we'll be sending out a survey asking for your feedback on our t uh, Lunch and Learn today. We'll also be asking you for any, uh, any ideas about what you would like to see for future Lunch and Learns. So please give us your ideas because we want to make sure that we tailor this to you and your interests. So today we're talking about Blackboard Ally. The great thing about the learning management system Blackboard that we have is that integrated with it is a tool called Ally. And Ally uh, enables us to, uh, for lack of a better term, perfect our courses to make them accessible for all students. Uh, why is this important? Well, we're going to see that accessibility is something that affects every single one of us. It affects every single learner. So our learning objectives for today, we're going to be explaining how Ally can help create uh, an accessible Blackboard design. In other words, how you build your course in the learning management system and how you make it accessible for students. Uh, we'll be demonstrating how to improve the accessibility of certain course design aspects. We'll be showing you what to look for. Uh, Ally is a tool that indicates for you where there's room for accessibility improvement. And we'll be identifying best practices to create more accessible learning materials. So we'll be looking at how to uh, preemptively prepare your courses so it's not something you have to do after the fact, right? Uh, so we've broken this down into three parts. This will be our agenda for today. In part one, we'll be looking at types of disabilities. I mentioned uh, in the introduction that accessibility is something that affects all of us. So we'll talk about that. Well, part two, we'll be looking at how to use Ally in Blackboard. And part three, we'll be looking at those proactive practices that can help us prepare our classes as we're designing them before we build them in Blackboard. So let's move into part one, types of disabilities. And here we see that disability is something that affects one uh, in four adults, or if we look at a larger number, 61 million adults in the United States are living with some form of disability. And when we talk about disability, we see that it's not always something you can see, right? So if we move here, we see that there are three types of disabilities that we could talk about. We could talk about permanent disabilities. Let's say you're somebody who uh, has had a limb amputated or something of that sort, so that would be permanent. Uh, there is a temporary disability if you're experiencing an arm injury. That's a disability that you're experiencing in the short term and one supposes you're going to heal out of that. And then there's the situational type of disability. Uh, so let's say you're a new parent and you have the rigors of a newborn infant and you're trying to juggle work and you're trying to juggle uh, going to school. That would be considered uh, a situational disability. So when we look at the functional disability types, we're looking at mobility, right? We're looking at upper lower limbs disability, manual dexterity. Uh, we look at cognition, the type of disabilities that uh, affect cognition. So dyslexia, for example, or a brain injury. These are types of uh, disability that we can't see, right? If you mention to somebody, oh, name for me a disability, more often than not, they would say, oh, somebody living in a wheelchair. Yes, we see that, right? But we also need to consider that other types of disabilities are quote unquote invisible, right? We don't see dyslexia, we don't see a brain injury. Hearing is another functional disability type. You could be completely deaf, partially deaf. Vision, low vision, right, is a type of disability or color blindness is a type of disability. Uh, in my previous role, I was also a type of instructional designer and many faculty members were shocked to, to, to think about the fact that they had never considered color blindness in their course designs. And then there are psychological disabilities, right? Again, this is a type of disability that we might not always see uh, in other adults and our students, whether that be depression, mental illness, and then lastly, we have other types of invisible disabilities such as chronic pain, sleeping disorders. These are all 
uh, things that can affect how a person learns, how a person functions day to day, right? So when I say that all learners benefit when we think about disabilities and when we think about accommodations and accessibility, it's because it's encompassing all of these different types of disability, but it's also catering to uh, students or adults who come from non-traditional situations, right? Uh, first generation students, maybe students uh, who are the first in their family to go to university and they don't either have the family support system or they haven't been uh, trained very well in, in good study tips. Um, we have veterans. Veterans uh, could come to our classrooms with you know, PTSD or other forms of disability. Uh, they are also coming from a specific situational background, right? One of, of discipline. Uh, we have adult learners. Adult learners are coming with very specific situations. Uh, I do specialize in adult learning theories uh, and instructional design for distance adult learners. Um, and you, when you design a course for an adult learner, you're taking into the consideration the fact that they have families, they have full-time jobs. In some situations, they have multiple jobs. They're working third shift, first shift, second shift. So you have a lot to consider for your adult learners. We have distance learners, right? Learners whose access to different technologies might be questionable whether that's uh, an adequate internet speed or, or access to uh, up-to-date computer system. We have learners with different learning styles. Does a learner learn best seeing, hearing, moving, and touching with their hands? So accessibility can help cater to that. And then lastly, learners whose first language is not English. When we think about accessibility, when we uh, incorporate these practices into our classroom, we're helping those students as well find different ways to be able to learn the material. So when we talk about accessibility, we need to differentiate it from user ability. They're not the same thing. When we t so here we have some compare and contrast. So accessibility, for example, providing closed captioning or scripts for video materials is not the same as embedding a video in Blackboard or providing a link to it. Great, you've provided the link to the, to the video. Now you need to provide the script or closed captioning so that different types of learners can access and, and learn from that video, right? Or Accessibility, documents that are formatted with titles and headings. Why is that important? Because visually impaired students are likely to use a screen reader when they are using digital materials. And that screen reader, in order to work efficiently, needs headings and titles to be able to read in an organized way. That's not the same as uh, providing a long piece of text. We want to break text up into manageable bits so that students with uh, living with other cognitive uh, disabilities can pay attention and can and, you know, eat up those little bits. And then lastly, materials that are being able to be read by a screen reader, that is, a, that is a, a, an, an indication of accessibility versus user ability, materials organized in folders. Organization is not a form of accessibility. It's just a form of user ability. So we're going to take a quick look at how a screen reader works okay? so that we get an idea of one form of accessibility. I'm a blind person who has been using screen readers, braille writers, scanning equipment, other adaptive technologies since my childhood. What a screen reader does is, for example, I'm going to read this, start to read this page. Navigation bottom. Link. University of California. San Francisco. Link. About UCSF. Link. Search UCSF. And what I will now do is slow down the speech rate. Rate 80%. 75%. 70%. 65%. 60%. 55%. 50%. 45%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 40%. 
instead of a mouse, a computer keyboard instead of a mouse. You can also use a braille display as an input device. End of navigation. And what it does is it cleverly determines what's on the screen and presents you that information you in a way that would allow for efficient navigation of these pages. So for example, I could just keep reading. Banner three items. Visited, link, image, home. Line by line and we could be here all day. Or I could jump to the first heading on the page. Heading level two, search for heading level two. You are here, heading level one, make videos accessible. So as I'm moving down through the page, I can look for the category that interests me. And I'm just using you commands built into the screen level. reader. So that's all a pretty simple description of what a screen reader is all about. Now I'm going to go over and show a few examples of how that can fall apart. So I have a couple graphics on this page. Mark Sutton hands on a MacBook Pro image. So the first one is well described and uses an alt tag. You are currently on it. To describe what that graphic is all about. Now we go to the next graphic. Reader 042116.jpg. Much less useful. So it's important to use those elements. Uh, it's also true for tables, so I'm going to move to a table. FDA approved medications, table, three columns, five rows, FDA approved medications, So table. the table is pretty self-explanatory, and I'm going to move into the table. Medicine, approved, column two of three. And then if I go down into the Row. table, Medicine. Told you and column as I move across, three. approved, 1975, column two of three. We're getting the labels for the column headers and row headers. So it's important when programming tables, forms, and other elements on the web pages to use the proper HTML codes. I'll go to the table three column. Second table on the page. Medicine. Row two of five told you to mind. And as I'm in the table, I move across it. Row November one nine nine five. I get a date, but I don't know what that date is associated with. So it's important, as I was saying, to include proper coding tags for all these elements. When developers pay attention to certain coding standards, blind persons are able to participate in digital communication. Being able to do such things as understand calendars and schedules, enroll in or teach classes, conduct research, and many more ex essential activities that are conducted electronically. If developers of web pages and applications fail to take into account these design considerations, many people will be left out, unable to use these tools of daily life that are now taken for granted by most of us. Great. So thank you to our guest speaker. Uh, so we mentioned on the previous slide, right, how providing a heading is a form of accessibility, right? And he demonstrates very well why that is. The screen reader, in order to navigate the page, as well as give the user an idea of what the page is about or how to uh, navigate the different parts of it. Those headers are instrumental in helping provide an accessible material to him, right? And if we were to just to open a Word document and just type our own header without using the header function, it's not a header and the screen reader won't read it as a header. And so that starts to create problems in terms of accessibility, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So before we move into part two, I do want to give the floor to Jonathan really quickly, who's going to speak to us about accommodations in general. This is a part that we wanted to add uh, because we think it's pretty important. So uh, Jonathan, floor is yours. I think what we need to talk about here, where we're going to go in today here is going to, the solutions that Matthew and I are going to demonstrate through Ally uh, will probably solve, let's say, you know, 85 to 90% of the sort of base issues when it comes to accessibility, right? So when we're talking about, you know, um, the kind of examples Matthew demonstrated, right? It will kind of make the course more accessible and it will solve most things. However, we are gonna have students who are gonna have more serious accommodational needs for those issues. Um, we're going to engage uh, Central University and have them help us assist with that. But in general, what I think is important in this conversation is that's really going to be all about, you know, trying to get a uniform base that will address most things. And I think if we extrapolate that one step further, um, and I know Lavana has talked about this a lot as well, you know, especially in an age where there's a lot going on in people's families, there's people remote, there's people not remote, right? Having a 
uh, a more positive attitude as a faculty member and saying things, you know, I'm sorry you're going through what you're going through, or how can I help, or what can we do to assist you, is a really effective way just, you know, to kind of make them feel heard and help them through that process and determine off the bat that it's something that we can do through maybe rescheduling a task or, you know, making the course more accessible on our end, or do we actually need to go and engage central? So I think that's a kind of distinction that we need to worry about, you know, how can we be more communicative with the student and how can we provide, you know, just a, 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 a forgiving and open atmosphere to talk about their issues and what they're going through because of the, we don't know what they're going through, right? It might, it might be like Matthew said, it might be visible, it might be inherent. So this is not a begin and end all. I think we might make clear. This is kind of more of a baseline. And then we go from there and we, we go up the chain depending on the level of severity. Okay, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and Jonathan is absolutely right. We don't know what students are going through. Um, I am coming into this role as a former faculty member. Um, I spent some time in that role uh, working with my colleagues uh, to delve into online education. And one of the big conversations that we had was we don't know. We don't know what our students are dealing with on a personal level. We don't know what they're dealing with on a uh, professional level. Right, uh, so we're not just talking about accessibility, we are talking about being open and receptive to our students so that we can help them succeed, because that's why we're here, right? To help them succeed. So moving into part two, Min, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Matthew. Um, so uh, this part we will talk about using uh, a lie and why do we need to use a lie? There's uh, several reasons for that. Uh, first, because it's already integrated in the Blackboard and it's very easy for you to use it. Um, another reason is, uh, first is first and foremost is for our students because ally provide the alternative learning format for students so that they normally they provide more than um, six uh, alternative learning um, format like audio or a PDF for students that meet with their needs. Um, the other reason is like it provides the guidance for faculties to how to improve the learning material uh, on the accessibilities. And uh, another reason is uh, in um, another level is for uh, institutional level because uh, online can provide the report for the uh, institutions to see how much uh, accessible for the course contents. And um, another reason because like um, our school need to follow the uh, ADA. Uh, ADA stand for the Americans uh, with Disability Act. Uh, it's kind of the um, very fundamental civil right, like it's prevent with the uh, discri discrimination um, people with disability. We need to make sure like provide the student with disability with the same uh, opportunity and the same access with the um, like every uh, everybody else. Um, so you know, in uh, in America, um, California is the state that has the highest. A uh, number of the lawsuits again, uh, the business that um, violate the ADA compliance. So of course we we don't want to uh, affect on our business, but um, uh, most of all we want to give um, the accessible learning material for all students to make them feel uh, included. So we are going to see a very short video uh, introduced about the ally on Blackboard. Have you noticed the color dials next to your files in your Blackboard courses? Those dials are a part of Ally, a tool that gauges the accessibility of documents and files uploaded to Blackboard. When you click a colored dial, Ally provides that file's accessibility score and provides instructions for how to improve accessibility. Many students in higher education do not communicate barriers to access. By proactively creating accessible course content, rather than thinking about accessibility one student at a time, faculty can create an inclusive learning environment for all students. What are your uh, like accessibility scores? So right next to the uh, any um, document that you upload to the Blackboard, you will see the four, uh, one of the four dial here. So it could be in red, in orange, light blue, uh, light green, or in um, green. So when the um, dial in red, it means that the uh, document is not um, accessible and it needs your attention. When the document, the, the dial is in orange, it means that it's a bit um, uh, better, uh, a bit um, accessible, but still limit with many students, and it needs to be improved. Um, when the uh, dial is in light green, it means uh, it's kind of really good, um, good um, indicate, indicator, but still need to improve on that. And with the um, 
the green one. Um, it is perfect and you don't need to improve uh, at this point. So this indicator is, is will show in the blackboard right next to the document, but it's just like the helpful guide for the faculty to see, and the student cannot see the um, these indicators in in the uh, right next to the document. And uh, as I said earlier, like Align provides alternative format such as like uh, HTMLs, um, HTMLs uh, for the student who use um, mobile devices. Um, it can be provide uh, audio uh, version for student uh, learning on the go, or it can be provide the um, um, tab PDF for student who use uh, screen reader. So we will see like in the student perspective, how they can uh, download the uh, different uh, format for um, that fit with the need in this video. So we'll see the list of alternative format the student can download. Um, then we will go, um, like how can we see, um, how uh, Ally can help, like how can see change the, um, how, how we can see the uh, score of the accessibility of the document that we upload. Um, we're going to see a very short video um, on how to uh, indicate the uh, Ally. We click on the um, dial to see. And then you, you will see the accessibility score and all the issue of the documents. And it also will give you the uh, guidelines on how to fix it. And as you can see, it walks you through the process of improving the accessibility score on these issues. So it will give you the explanations, like why you, you need to fix this and, um, uh, and the step-by-step -step guidance. And when you're done, you uh, just re-upload the files again. Uh, in another level, is for institutional level. It, like uh, Align will um, provide the, course, the uh, accessibility report for the whole course. Um, so you can check like how many files that you already uploaded to your course and how accessible it is for students. Um, by going to the accessibility report on the uh, menu bar, and when you run it, you can see like how many files do you have and um, the accessibility score for the whole course. And under the overview, it, you will see on your um, right hand side, um, you will see the easiest issue to fix uh, of the documents. And the, um, in the content tab, it will list you um, the, whole, um, the whole file of the course. And you, will, um, you can fix the accessibility score within uh, this kind of report. So normally the easiest um, um, issue to fix in the online is which, um, you add the un alternative text uh, for the image. It will be the easiest um, accessibility issue that can fix. So now um, the indicator will change from the red to um, to the green, and it will increase. Had to increase the total uh, score uh, of the course. So if from uh, like eighty nine to ninety one percent, a B plus to an A minus. Yeah. Um, so in in this part, um, when it uh, when we talk about the accessibility of the price. Uh, normally, it comes with some uh, common issues that we usually um, uh, face when we uh, work on the course design. Um, so the first one is the heading. Uh, I think the heading and the tag PDF is the most two important um, issues uh, because the why the heading is important because it's like uh, when the your document had the headings, just like you give your document the roadmap, so the student 
they can use the tab to like very easily to scan uh, the structure of the uh, documents, what is inside the documents. And it's very helpful uh, for those who use uh, the, the screen reader. Um, Normally, when uh, we use um, the document, we just, uh, for example, um, when we use the uh, Microsoft Word, we make the text like bold and bigger, but it doesn't make um, it the heading. We need to use the built-in functions in, in Microsoft to make it the heading. Because the screen reader, they cannot recognize the words is like bigger or bold or, or in different uh, color. Um, so we will see how to create the heading in the Microsoft Word in, in this video. So we cho you choose the heading to make it a real heading for the, your documents. So uh, there are several levels of headings for the document that you can choose. So you make it bigger, it doesn't mean uh, it's the heading, yeah. Just means it's bigger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, for example, when the um, student who need to use a screen reader, uh, they go through the uh, syllabus. So if we um, create the header for the syllabus, like um, cost descriptions, great policy or cost breakdown. So a student who use screen reader, it's very easy for them to tap and, and looking for what information that they need rather than they need to like read um, very lengthy document to find um, the information that uh, what they're looking for. And it's the same with the table header. Um, we need to use the table header to give the right information for the for the self. And um, here is the um, sample of how we create the table header for, for the table. So in the Microsoft Word under Home, we're looking for the table design. And then we click on the header row. So you can see the, in the uh, header rows, it will change um, the header of the table. So we just use the table for the convey the da data only. It's not for decoration because like you already see in the video, in the previous video, uh, it's really difficult for screen reader to um, follow the uh, data in the, the table. And a quick note about tables. General rule of thumb is if when you click on the table in a column or on a row, if the cursor appears, you're good to go. If the cursor does not appear, you need to write alternative text for that because that means that the uh, screen reader will not be able to read the individual rows and columns of that table. In the picture above, you will see the um, uh, logo of Google. On your right hand side is the uh, old logo from Google. And uh, in your left hand side is the new uh, logo that they created uh, in 2015. Um, they use the serif fonts for the old uh, logo and the sans serif fonts for the new logos. The serif is mean like if we have the small tail, uh, the curve in, 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 the, um, in the text. So you, you can see in the cycle here. So um, the serif font is uh, more uh, readable for the, for the uh, uh, paper or the book. But um, the sans serif is mean without serif. It's much, e much easier and cleaner for um, digital uh, user. So, we, sorry. Yeah. I was gonna, when we, when we talk about cognitive uh, function and the ability to retain information, when we use sans serif fonts for screens, uh, studies show that cognitive function, that remembering the information is greater than if we were to use serif fonts because something happens in the cognitive flow that when we're reading on screen, how, for whatever reason, this is easier for our minds to maintain versus in books, Serif fonts were designed to be read on print, on printed paper. And for whatever reason, studies show that this is easier to retain, to retain information when you're reading on, on printed paper. The mind is a fascinating thing. 
So actually, Sanctuary Fund is, cre uh, is created um, to, uh, for the uh, digital, digital world. Um, and it's very helpful for students with the dyslexia um, to read uh, because it's much clean and it helps students in the distant classroom I uh, can see on the screen. So there are several um, common fonts that you can use, um, but this one not like um, when we use the fonts, be consistent with what we choose because like in one paragraph, if we use one or two type of um, two or three type of font, it will be very uh, difficult and it's not really visual appealing for the student to see. Yeah. And with this uh, example in particular, we see two fonts, two uh, sans serif fonts, right? We see Verdana and Calibri. And we wrote this example on purpose. I see one lovely difference because we can see how each, how one font, I would argue, is better than the other because of the distinction it makes between uh, certain letters and numbers. So in Verdana, I is differentiated from the one, which is differentiated from L, versus in Calibri, it's much more difficult to see those differences, in particular the capital I and the lowercase l. They look the same, right? They look the same. So if you, I, I don't know, I'm throwing this example out there, if you are um, not native to the English language and uh, you're, you're new to the English language and you're trying to read these sentences and Maybe you don't, is that an L? Is that a capital I? I'm not sure. So some fonts are, people would argue this, I, I'm gonna put out my subjective uh, uh, opinion. Some fonts are better than others. And in this case, we see why. And then when we talk about another issue, we look at color contrast. Uh, color contrast, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of our talk today, is something that people often overlook, right? We take for granted that we can see color. If we are able to see color, we, we uh, sometimes overlook that there are people who are colorblind. My own father is colorblind, so it's something I'm familiar with because my dad will come out in a dark blue shirt and, and black pants, and uh, I'll make fun of him for it because I'm his son, I can do that and then he'll, he'll be like, oh, well, I just, I don't care. I don't know, I don't see it. But anyway, so here we see different forms of uh, uh, color contrast. And you can see in particular, even if you don't live with the form of color blindness uh, or, or, or any other uh, thing like it, it's still difficult to read some of these, wouldn't you agree? So the second one, can you read me in that palish yellow against a white backdrop is very, very difficult. You're shaking your head, no. I mean, I'm, I'm right here and I have a hard time seeing it. Uh, versus here we see good color contrast, the first one and the last one, right? The dark blue and the white inside of it, uh, that contrast is very sharp. Or black against a white background, again, that contrast is very sharp. That is a good color contrast. So we say that because one of the things we hope to avoid is making information, important information, more than just color coded because that's easy to miss. So we have a few, uh, a few options here. We can resort to the uh, color contrast, right? We can use light colors with dark colors and make sure those contrasts are very distinguishable. And then we can provide labels, right? We can provide labels in case a blue and a black that we provide uh, cannot be seen by somebody living with color blindness, we still have the labels to differentiate those parts of the pie chart, right? Or even better, we can use textured colors. Even though these are all the same color, we can differentiate each piece of the pie chart because of the texture, right? And I would say the one thing still missing from this pie chart are the labels. But even though we're still using the same color for each of these pieces, we can easily differentiate what they are because of that texture. Yeah, so we make sure like when we give the information, color is not the only way to convey the information. Right, that's the key piece here is that color should not be the only way to convey information, exactly. Another thing we want to mention is white space. I think this is a very common thing to overlook. We're so excited when we put together our lesson plans and when we're in the classroom that we overlook how much information we're putting up at once, 
right? We mentioned uh, when we were looking at accessibility versus usability, we mentioned breaking things up in more manageable chunks rather than providing everything at once. And here's an example why. This is an email that Jonathan sent out uh, at the beginning of the semester. We're using it as an example. This is overwhelming. This is a lot of information, and there's not a lot of white space on this slide. So if we were to break this up, we see that this is a lot more manageable. And not only did we break it up, we used bullet points. In the world of online education, which is something that I also try to uh, bring over to in the classroom education, bullet points help make information more digestible. They help us organize more clearly, right? They help students follow the information more easily and there's more white space on the screen. Why is white space important? Because white space, studies show, provide up to 20% more comprehension of the material. The more white space you have, the easier it is to remember what you're studying, what you're reading. And here we have a quote from a study, properly using white space between paragraphs and in the left and right margins has been proven to increase comprehension by up to 20%. The skill of using white space lies in providing your users with a digestible amount of content, then stripping away extraneous materials. If we were to go back and compare the original slide with the long email that, uh, Jonathan, I'm not, I'm not beating you up, the long email that Jonathan sent out versus the bullet points, the bullet points stripped a lot of that unnecessary verbiage away and provided just the important details with providing that white space that has been proven to increase comprehension. Um, so another common uh, accessibility issue is the untag. Untag is mean like uh, when you are using the um, image and you hover over through the, the image and you can see um, the green, um, the gray book uh, with the uh, tag this, this script, um, what it, the image is about. Um, so uh, when we use the image, we want to make sure like something we use just like the decorative but sometimes we want it to convey the information. So that's why we want to make sure um, the, the, who, uh, for those who use screen reader, they know the information, they know the meaning of the photo, uh, of the image. And uh, how long for the answer it could be? It could be in one or two sentences because like um, for the uh, screen reader, they normally they take like three to five times longer than the um, than us who read the documents uh, vi visually. So we want to make the untag is short, but informative and meaningful. And you can use the untag not, for, uh, not only for the image, but also for the graph, for the um, clip art, for the uh, video or audio. So in this uh, video, um, I will show um, how to add the untag uh, for the image on the uh, Microsoft Word. So you right click on the image and choose um, alternative and write um, the uh, description for the uh, image. And um, the description need to be aligned with the content. Um, and if you map it like uh, decorated, the screen reader will ignore it like pretend um, the photo is, isn't there. Otherwise, you can leave it for uh, Microsoft Word uh, to um, automatically ge generate the description for you. Um, then another issue is on the is the hyperlink. So um, uh, when the screen reader they they use um, they use it, uh, they have the option to export the uh, the links into separate windows so that they can um, uh, quickly scan um, the links in in the documents. And if we um, and when they export, the screen reader will sweep out every uh, related. Um, text around and just leave the user with the with the text and the links only. So like if we use like um, we, we see uh, usually like um, if you want uh, to know more information, click here. So all of the reader can receive is just only the text here and they have no idea uh, what is going on next uh, if they click on the links. Um, and in this video, we will see like we shouldn't use the full uh, URL for that because the screen reader will read everything. So 
So it's the way how you um, add the uh, hyperlinks for, for the links. Yeah. Uh, in the next one, we will see the uh, video uh, closed caption and transcriptions. Uh, closed uh, captions mean the narration appear on the screen um, and follow the same timing of the video. And the transcript is the um, narrations um, in the separate documents. Um, and the closed caption and transcription is really helpful for those who may be uh, l um, hearing loss or um, uh, they are like in the COVID, they need to share the same learning um, or working room with others and they don't have enough um, internet bandwidth to watch the video. And um, as I shared with um, Jonathan this morning, like when I was studying in the Castell East Bay, normally I need to take like five hours uh, back and forth from my play to the campus every day. And it's like impossible for me to watch the uh, video lectures on the bus. So um, I print out the um, transcription in advance and take a note on that uh, when I go to school. So it's really helpful. And um, uh, when you work on the closed captions, uh, especially uh, in the Zoom or Google Slide, you have option to choose um, uh, present with closed caption and it will um, automatically generate the closed caption for you. Or, or even when you upload to the YouTube, um, it also has the option for you to generate the closed caption, even if it's not um, 100 um, accurate. And for the transcription, you can um, do it by when you record the video, you can um, write the um, transcript in advance uh, in case you don't want to miss anything when you uh, record. And, uh, and uh, another reason is you can give for students. Um, and when you use the Microsoft Word, it has the option like the dictate that you can um, type in uh, like free, uh, hand free. The uh, Microsoft Word will um, um, capture what you are talking and you have uh, di different files. And here is the uh, example, what is transcript and what is closed captions. For anyone who has async video in their classes, um, if you don't already have transcript or closed captions, reach out to us, we will do that as for free as part of your class. So we can take all your video and make sure they're, if it's, you know, video you create yourself and make sure that they're closed captioned or transcribed, right? If it's video that's outside the class, um, uh, depending on where it is and where it's coming from, we can take a look at because there's copyright issues. But if it's video you guys have created internally, we can do this for you. So if you have a concern with video, let us know and we'll, we'll see what we can get to sort out for you. And the last one, but very important ones, because like um, according to the uh, Blackboard Ally report, um, tag PDF and HTML is the most two uh, common file that students download when they use Ally. Uh, the reason is maybe like tag PDF, the student don't need to have the uh, Microsoft accounts or any uh, specific uh, app to read the PDF. And the HTML is because it's very responsive and friendly with the uh, user who use a mobile device or iPad. Um, and we see a lot of untagged PDF um, in the uh, when um, design the learning materials. So how does it look like? It will be in this video. So when the uh, PDF is untagged, um, the, the student who use screen reader, it, like, it will be impossible for them to, um, to, to uh, read the um, documents. Because like, the tag is like the invi in, um, like invisible heading. So that is differentiate between the heading, the paragraph, and it could be um, aside the untagged for the image and it could be as associate the data cell with the table header. So the um, untapped, um, the, the tag PDF is really important. Um, so that is a way had the solution for that. So if you create the content in the Blackboard content creators, that will be the function for you to check if the um, your document is uh, okay to go and if have any accessible um, uh, issue for the documents. So in this video, we will see how to um, fix the um, accessibility issues in the co uh, black Blackboard content creators. So this image haven't had the alternative uh, descriptions. So I just uh, right click on that and um, enter the uh, description.
and you add the heading style for the text. And then you check the accessibility and see uh, if there is still any issue that we uh, haven't fixed before we public the contents. And um, we can check the accessibility in the Microsoft Word and uh, PowerPoint uh, as well. So under the review uh, tab, we will click on the check accessibility. And on your uh, left hand side, you will see the accessibility report with all the accessibility issues. And at the, uh, the bottom, you will see why we need to fix that and step-by-step -step, um, guidance on how to fix. Uh, and if you usually using Google Doc on slide, it uh, uh, also has the way to uh, fix the accessibility uh, on the uh, Google Doc and slide. You click on add-on and looking for um, Greg docs or uh, Greg uh, slides. And then, then you install it to the um, your uh, Google Docs. So it will be the same uh, with the uh, Microsoft Google um, with the Microsoft Word. Um, there will be the report for you uh, at the end with the step-by-step -step instructions and the problems with your documents. Yeah. And um, the last um, access, um, accessibility check that we can do is on the Adobe um, uh, when you use for the uh, PDF file. Uh, but actually, um, it's better for you to uh, fix the accessibility on the Word, uh, Microsoft, or Google Slide, uh, Google Talks, um, before convert it to the PDF. Because when you work on the PDF file, it could take a lot of time and lots of effort. And sometimes it's not um, like uh, totally accessible. It also has the tool uh, named Accessibility. And then you choose for accessibility check. And you left all the checker up of fly defaults and click on start checking. So it will give you the uh, accessibility reports as well. So it will give you the uh, guidance and step-by-step uh, -step, um, and of the issue that the document have. So we are, if you have any problems uh, or you want to um, practice more uh, about the accessibility check, so just feel free to reach out to us anytime and we are happy to like, practice and work with you. Great, so this brings us into the takeaway. So we're gonna uh, summarize what we did here today. We talked about accessibility and how it helps all types of learners in all types of situations, right? Uh, we talked about Ally and how it's integrated with uh, Blackboard and how it helps us identify room for improvement, ways we can uh, improve the accessibility scores in our course builds. We also want to emphasize that planning for accessibility takes time. We know that we covered a lot of material today, and a lot of this is probably quite new uh, to some, if not all of you. Uh, we don't expect an accessible course by tomorrow. This takes planning, right? One of the reasons why we wanted to introduce you to the proactive steps you can take, right? Making sure that a Microsoft document or a Microsoft Word document is accessible, tagging your PDFs. When you take those initial steps before putting those materials on Blackboard, you save yourself time, right? You save yourself time because then you don't have to go back and fix your materials that you already spent time making. And Min talked about, for example, making sure that a Microsoft Word document is accessible before you convert it to a PDF is much quicker and easier than going back to that PDF and trying to improve its accessibility score. 
And then lastly, we, want to, we, we are going to share this presentation with you. Uh, we want to make sure that you have these resources, that you can go back to this presentation and review what you feel you, I thought I heard the fire alarm, excuse me, what you feel you want to, uh, or that's a really loud cricket, what you want to review. Also, we are here to help, like Min mentioned. Uh, next slide, Min. Uh, on this presentation, you will find our email address. Please reach out to us, and we are happy to set up a consultation with you where we can discuss any of your concerns regarding your course builds and accessibility. Just keep in mind, like when we create the accessible learning material for students, we are not only accommodate for a group of students, but we, but actually, we offer the accessible learning material for all students because we all learn differently. So uh, please, like, be considerate and and um, um, when design, we uh, upfront we uh, thinking about our students. It, yeah, thank you.